Rise of the Exile, Book One of the Shadow of the Tyrant King series by J. D. Matter. Chapter 46 Justim's Quest. There was some cragginess to the hills northwest of Devonstone. Grassy fields eventually yielded to their rocky slopes. Justin would rather travel directly west to delve into the western woodlands directly. Garrett knew, however, that the bulk of the Black Eagle's legion would be stifled in the dense forest. Therefore, he deduced that they would more likely be found on the ancient road. So Justin followed his orders closely, a remarkable feat in and of itself, and headed toward the Wickermore Falls. The wind carried a hint of the never-ending crash of water. It came as a slight mist and gentle rushing sound. Justum hastened his gait, which rattled his arrow-filled quiver and shook the short sword at his hip. He held his weapons steady as he jogged. One hand pulled the strap of his quiver taut, while the other rested on his sword's hilt, thereby allowing him to rush quietly through the tall grass. His eyes were persistently watchful of anything that would challenge him. That seemed an almost ridiculous notion, for he was still in familiar territory. It was prudent, however, to remain vigilant. In the distance, the world seemed to drop away. The Wickermore River cut through the hills and Justum could see where it converged with a steep edge. Beyond that, there was water vapor rising up like smoke. That had to be the Wickermore Falls. Justum jogged toward the line of watery smoke. The crashing water's increasing loudness told him he was going the right way. Soon, the world was filled with the waterfall's constant, robust noise. Justum stood at the precipice's daunting edge and looked to the land beyond. He was high and could see far. The dense woods lie ahead and below, waiting for all eternity. He could see the hole in the forest's wall. That small clearing was where the ancient road cut through. It was a gateway into that shadowy place. Justin had never been there before, and he could hardly wait to see it. First, he would have to backtrack south and find an acceptable decline in the topography. Justin wondered how long that would take. Too long. There was a much faster way to get down, he knew. His toes inched over the void. The lake below was far beneath him. What was the worst that could happen? He could die, but what a great way to go, Justin thought. No, he corrected himself. His friends needed him to accomplish this task. He turned to walk away. The sudden urge overwhelmed him. He turned and leaped. He hung in the air for a second, completely free. Then that sickening lurch pulled him down. The loud wind in his ears overtook the loudness of the waterfall. Justin whooped. Luckily, the water beneath him looked dark and deep. He plunged into the cool water and his whole world was suddenly quiet. Delicate bubbles danced all around. He heard the muffled crashing of the waterfall behind him. He could feel it sucking him back in. His arms and legs worked together with all their might to swim away from that relentless current. A sigh of bubbles escaped his mouth after he gained enough distance to no longer hear the muffled falls. When his head popped out of the water, the world was suddenly loud again. The falls were still there, louder than before, it seemed, perhaps angry that its prey escaped. Justin backstroked to the shore, looking up at the peaceful clouds drifting by overhead. He sloshed out of the water and looked back one last time. The silvery vein-like reflections danced about the water's surface. The Wickermore Falls were quieted by distance. He knew it was probably the last grand expanse he would see for a while. He marched up to the forest's dark gateway. The ancient road of broken, jumbled stone littered the forest floor. He crossed over the natural threshold and was enveloped by eerie green dimness. The sun filtered through the swaying treetops, hinting at the broad sky above them. The leafy wooden giants stretched up high and lined the ancient road like a wall, making a vast natural corridor. Justin walked by the side of the road, ready to disappear into the depths of the forest at the first sign of trouble. The woods were loud with crickets and bird songs. There were pleasant flowery aromas wafting through the trees. 
This was the epitome of the woodland realm. It would have been a wondrous voyage if he weren't constantly preoccupied with what might be approaching. Hours went by and nothing did approach. He was alone. As he walked, he ate a sandwich Vianette had prepared for him. It was delicious. It made him wonder how far he had to go, or if his food would run out, or if he would have to hunt. And how good was the hunting here anyway? The dim green light of the woods was fading. Out on the horizon, wherever that was, the sun was setting. Just as he began to think of setting up camp, he sensed it. Something was barely off the road. It was gentle and subtle. He did not hear or see it, but he knew it was there. Justin stepped out onto the stones of the broken road where his footfalls would be silent. He knelt down and was still and quiet. Then he saw it. The Gladeland Doe gingerly stepped into the openness of the road corridor. A normal deer would have made noise when its hoof struck stone, but the Gladeland Doe stepped silently. It looked away from Justum's direction. That was his chance to slide the bow from his arm and knock an arrow. The doe's ears twitched forward and backward with every slight sound he made. Justum was too silent, however for the doe to suspect anything. Justin aimed two feet ahead of the deer, for he knew that's where the animal would be once it heard the crack of his bow. He pulled the bowstring taut, and it sounded like twisting leather. He let it go. The doe leaped. The arrow thudded into its ribs, and its nimble legs failed as it crashed. The doe twitched and died. Justin chuckled, for all the long hunts and hours of tedious tracking went wasted. In the end, it was a matter of sheer, unbridled luck. Justin's food questions had been answered. He shuffled off the road and found a twenty-foot clearing in the woods. Quickly, before full darkness descended, he managed to start a fire and cook some of the meat. It was unlike anything he had ever tasted. He wondered if anyone had ever eaten such succulent meat. There were side effects. He felt invigorated. He felt springy, like the dough itself. He abandoned all thoughts of sleep. It felt like midday to him. He had too much energy to sleep. After cooking as much as he could, he packed away some more meat and set out into the night. The nighttime forest was a different world. The crickets were deafening. Millions of blinking firefly lights flashed within the forest's depths like distant stars. Once in a while, the moan of some unknown, unseen animal would resound. Overhead tree branches creaked in the wind. The rapid percussion of a woodpecker's bill echoed. He was putting some respectable distance behind him when he saw something very incongruous. It was a slight dim blue glow ahead, quite inconsistent with the black night he had become accustomed to. Justum's pace slowed as he moved cautiously beside the road's broken stones. As he delved deeper down the path, the indigo light grew more prominent. The trees formed an archway, and beyond it, there seemed to be nothing except the blue light, whatever it was. Justum knew it could not be the end of the western woodlands. It was an interior phenomenon. He stepped through the archway of boughs and saw the largest expanse he had seen since entering the woods. It was a lake that glowed blue. Justum was not sure what caused the eerie glow. The sight was very alien. The pool was dead calm, like a sheet of solid blue glass upon the forest floor. The ancient road continued over it in the form of an equally ancient-looking arching stone bridge. The vines and vegetation had entwined and snaked its way through every seam where block met block. As the vines grew, they no doubt weakened the structure— Justin was not concerned about that, however, for he was a good swimmer, strange glowing water or not. Justin casually stepped onto the bridge. It was solid at first, but as he went farther, the stones seemed to wiggle beneath his feet. 
The sapphire light shined upward so unnaturally he had to get a closer look. In the middle of the bridge, right over the keystones, he stepped to the edge and looked at the water below. There were no reflections and no transparency, just solid blue light. Weird, he said. As he spoke, the stones beneath him crumbled away and plunked into the water, sending ripples across the once smooth surface. He tried to leap back, but there was no substance beneath his feet. He fell down and smacked the back of his head on the bridge as he went. He plunged into cool blueness and the pool was alive with his waves. Justin surfaced and yelled as he vigorously rubbed the back of his head. It was not too bad. There might be some swelling. He bobbed there for a moment, feeling like he was flying high in a clear blue sky. Now that he was in it, he could see that the water was clear after all, but the deep bottom was well beyond sight. Justin did not know that he should not have disturbed the water. The lake was merely the end of a water vein, deep beneath the surface. It connected with underground rivers, lakes, and aquifers. Like some watery nervous system of the world, the underground maze stretched far beyond even the woodland realm. No one knew of that pool's connection to the water realm. That world's creatures were wholly alien to the woodlands. One such wayward creature had glided through, lost in the underground waters until it reached the pool in which Justin floated. Justin began to quietly doggy paddle for the shore. As he did, the blue light grew noticeably brighter. When Justin looked down into the depths, he finally saw where the light was coming from. A giant jellyfish was ascending. Its translucent dome expanded and contracted. It was at least 50 feet wide when it expanded. Its long tentacles trailed off into the unseen depths. It pulsed and glowed. It was strange to see such a large thing move in utter silence. Justin was enthralled by it. Yes, the thing was strange, but it was also beautiful. Its long, ruffled tentacles fanned out, crossing the whole lake with its span. That looked very threatening. Justin accelerated, splashing wildly as he swam. Then the shock came. The water was intensely electrified, and Justin's muscles painfully seized. When he regained the use of his body, he flailed madly for the shore, feeling somehow infected by the oddness of it all. He reached the shore and stumbled out. His mad dash clouded the water with muddy puffs. Justin was on his back and propped up on his elbows. He was not breathing too hard to exhale a nervous chuckle. In an instant, he had regained his composure. Sorry, he said. Not this time, my strange blue friend. The dome of the jellyfish crested above the surface. It kept rising. Soon, the entire dome was out of the lake and water was pouring off it. Its wicked tentacles started emerging. Justin quickly realized that he still was not safe. The jellyfish rose up like a tower on the water. Justin scrambled to his feet and retrieved his bow. Several lightning bolts shot out of the jellyfish and struck all around Justin. It was a powerful weapon, but not accurate. The air was alive with electricity, and its attack had even caused thunder to rumble in the clouds high above. Justin's hair was standing up. He loosed an arrow upon the monster. The projectile went through the dome and kept going into the trees beyond. A string of blue slime trailed in the arrow's wake. The jellyfish made a shrill squeal that was unbearable, so unbearable that Justin would not dare attack with his bow again. He ran instead. The jellyfish, suddenly unencumbered, could glide faster out of the water. The last of its ugly tentacles came splashing out as it glided high above. 
The blue light followed just him, so he knew the creature was not far behind. More forks of electricity crackled and buzzed all around him. The slimy tentacles reached for him. He ran toward the darkness ahead. That's when he saw the red eyes open up in the blackness before him. Just him stopped. The red eyes approached. It was a dark wolf. The very thing Garrett had warned him about. One of Kuroth's minions from Obsidia, deep within the Fire Realm. Justim spun around and ran back toward the jellyfish, the lesser of the two evils. He heard the quick patter of the dark wolf's padded paws. An arc of electricity lashed out and stung Justim, causing him to tumble end over end. The dark wolf converged on Justim and the jellyfish. Kuroth's minion would have attacked any living thing, but at the moment, the jellyfish was the greater threat, so it directed its first attack on the floating monstrosity. The wolf leaped up, snapping its jaws. Its teeth clamped a tentacle, and that awful squeal resounded again. Lightning shot through the dark wolf, but it seemed unaffected. Justin ran past the fighting monsters and disappeared into the safety of the dark woods. He ran as far and fast as he could. The sounds of jellyfish squeals and dark wolf growls echoed far behind him. Garrett told him to stay quiet. The dark wolves will hear you, Garrett had said. Luckily for Justin, the jellyfish had alerted the dark wolf to its presence. As Justim got away, the unfortunate jellyfish was falling to that harsh, obsidian creature. Justim barely had a chance to look at it. He hoped that he would not get another chance to see one of Kuroth's minions. The benefits of the dome meat did not yet wear off. Justim crept along the ancient road all night. The light of the world slowly appeared and his surroundings were green again. He thought he was imagining the dark shapes that were around him in the night. In the daylight, however, he could see that they were ancient ruins. Half-crumbling towers of old rose up everywhere, defying the woods with stone. Justin wandered through the hint of a castle's perimeter. The walls had disintegrated eons ago. That place might have once been a great stronghold, a great seat of power. Alas, it was lost to time. The day before, Keen Justum had actually felled a Gladeland doe, proving he was more than acquainted with the hunt. Therefore, he was able to recognize when he was being hunted. There was definitely something out there, stalking him. It could see him, yet he could not see it. A helpless feeling. What he did see, however, were traces. At times, the breeze carried a foul odor. There were tracks in the soft dirt of the road's shoulder. The tracks looked like those that might belong to a wolf, only twice as big. He thought he heard a pant. He thought he heard the licking of chops. Death was hunting. Now he was the Gladeland Doe. Garrett's warning echoed in his thoughts. Dark wolves did not belong in the lush forest. They were indigenous to rougher places, places like Obsidia. There in the soft woods, they had free reign. Their wickedness was unmatched in that place. Justin saw a circular tower that still looked sturdy. He looked up toward the parapets. It was time to bring the old structure out of retirement. He removed his pack and pulled out the last of the dough meat. Justin splayed the meat out on the ground and then hurried to the base of the tower. He went through the old stone archway and climbed the stairs, which jutted out from the wall and spiraled upward. There was a spot where the stairs were gone, and he had to leap the gap and pull himself up. He reached the battlements, readied his bow, and watched the sweet dough meat on the ground far below. He had been like this many times before. He had waited in silence for some unsuspecting animal to cross his sights on many previous occasions. This was the first time, however, that his life was in the balance. 
He liked that. It seemed fairer. It was a long time before he heard the rustle of leaves. The dark wolf stepped cautiously out of the woods, sniffing the air. Justum knew it could not resist the sweet venison. It timidly made its way toward the suspiciously available meat. Its long nails clicked on the stone road. Justum got a good look at the vicious, lean animal. At first glance, it almost looked bear-like. The dark wolf, however, was far more sinister than any mere bear. It was blacker than coal. Its ratty mane puffed out like a lion's. It was heavier than a man, and if it stood on its hind legs, it would be taller than Garrett. Justum decided to skewer the beast before it could taint his precious meat with those gross strings of dripping jewel. He knocked an arrow and let it fly. As with the doe, the arrow thudded into its rib cage. It whimpered. Fire shot out of the wound instead of blood. It was shocking to see, but Justum did not hesitate. He let loose another arrow. The second arrow struck a mere inch from the first and protruded clean through to the other side. Now the dark wolf was screaming. It looked up at Justum and bared its fangs, which gleamed whiter than sunlit snow. The low rumble of its growl shook the leaves. It ran for the safety of the dense trees. Justum let arrow after arrow fly down upon it in rapid succession. Thud! Thud, thud, they all hit home. Fire spilled out of each wound like molten lava. It left a trail of dying flames in its wake. The thing took a lot of punishment and still got away. At least the dark wolf would taste neither roasted Gladeland dough nor raw Justum on that day. Justum climbed down and continued walking until late in the afternoon. He carried his bow in his left hand and an arrow in his right. He was prepared to impale anything that made noise louder than a frog. It was then that he heard the distant murmur of a heated battle. Chapter 47 The Calm Before the Storm He's back! shouted Blake. Just him had been gone for a full week. During that time, Garrett had slightly recovered. When he heard Blake's excited shout, he tried to get off the couch and stumbled toward the door. Vianette would not have it. Stay right there, she said, and relax. Garrett could not help but feel like they were both pregnant, for he was just as immobilized as she was. More so, even. Filthy Justin tracked into the mansion where everyone awaited his assessment. His clothes had been torn and haphazardly tied back together. He had a few scratches and bruises. He looked tired. There were only two arrows left in his quiver. Justin, are you okay? asked Lucas. Fine, he replied. But the news ain't good. The excited expressions drained from everyone's faces and were instead replaced with grave concern. The White Eagle men are fighting. Those blokes are heroic. I've never seen such gallantry. Good, said Blake. Yeah, but they're losing, replied Justin. Sure, the Black Eagle has to fight for every inch of ground, but the White Eagle isn't going to hold out much longer. That's what I was afraid of, said Garrett. The Black Eagle out there ain't like the Black Eagle that was here said Justum as he looked to Garrett for approval, and Garrett nodded for him to reveal what he saw. Kuroth is unstoppable. He uses these huge wolves to attack people, wolves that spew fire and are damn near impossible to kill. I personally put a half dozen arrows into one, and it just ran off like I smacked it with a rolled-up newspaper. That ain't all he's got either. He's rolling through with these giant siege weapons. Sometimes the White Eagle falls back and uses some ruins for cover, but Kuroth just obliterates them with catapults. What are we gonna do? asked Blake. That ain't all, Justin persisted. 
He's got these huge giants. I swear, they're the biggest living things I've ever seen. When they walk, it's like an earthquake. Mercenaries, explained Garrett. When last I crossed the Fifth Legion's path, there were no giants. Kyle must have put a dent in the Black Eagle's forces. I would have thought that was a good thing, but if Kuroth is augmenting his legion with giants, then we're in trouble. Gigi finished his statement. It won't be long before the White Eagle is in full retreat, said Justin. Maybe it'll be a week or two, but they're coming. Then we have to get out of here, yelled Blake. No, Garrett yelled back. There is nowhere to go. We are at the edge of civilization. Would you ask my sister to give birth on the forest floor? She is in no condition to go anywhere. Besides, will you run your entire life away? We need to make a stand. Cree is the last bastion of peace in the woodland realm. I'll not leave it to the claws of a barak. Right, said Lucas. What shall we do then? You're all skilled fighters, answered Garrett. I have made sure of that. I have seen smaller forces defeat larger ones through sheer cunning. That is what we must do. Everyone looked highly troubled by his reasoning, but when Garrett drew up his battle plan, there was an inkling of hope. Everyone in town coordinated and moved quickly to enact the heir's will. Those who could not fight stayed in their homes. The others prepared for the coming battle. Blake was in charge of weapons and armor detail. The occupying force of the Black Eagle had left behind many weapons. Blake distributed them according to everyone's preference, but he got first pick. He chose an enormous battle axe that was far too cumbersome for anyone except him. Garrett remembered when he was a child and had disguised himself as a soldier. That gave him an idea. He had Justum distribute the old Black Eagle uniforms that were left behind. They detested resembling their foes, but it was a good way to confuse the enemy. A green cloth tied around the upper arm would distinguish them, so they would be wary to not attack each other by mistake. Justum, who had proved his worth, was given the important task of finding the right time and place for everyone clad in the enemy's garb to slip in amongst the unsuspecting legion's ranks. Gigi was positioned in a cul-de-sac where they had set up a crowd of mannequins from Lady Sweetsap's dress shop. From a distance, the crowd of wooden dummies looked real enough. The Black Eagle would hopefully be lured in, where Gigi could hit them with a holding spell. Then, a contingent of archers would be ready to unleash arrows from the surrounding rooftops. Lucas's two selves went around the perimeter of Devonstone, setting up every kind of magical trap he could manage. Gigi's precious book, The Ways of Demogorok, had many such spells. They were spells that would freeze, burn, impale, poison, tie up, tear apart, crush, electrocute, drown, or mercilessly tickle to death. Lucas deduced that Demogorok must not have been a very nice person. During the week to come, fighting positions, choke points, and ambushes were set. No less than half the town kept a vigil at a time while the others rested. The streets of Devonstone were soon empty. Everyone was still, watching or waiting. They were ready. Another week went by. Finally, on October 1st, they saw something. The remarkable airship of the White Eagle emerged through the clouds over the western woodlands in the distance. It was a silent abnormality in the sky, coming toward them like a dark moon. Everyone watched it slowly lumber closer, getting bigger. It was higher than when they last saw it two years ago. Much higher. It was nearly overhead before they heard the deep hum of its engines. Soon, it became sickeningly obvious that the White Eagle airship was bypassing Devonstone altogether. It passed by, and soon they were looking at the finned stern of the vessel. Just as they began to feel abandoned, they saw several glimmering objects glide out from beneath the airship. 
It was Kyle on his Pegasus. He was at the head of a V formation of white eagle soldiers astride bright white flying horses. They swooped gracefully, masters of the sky, and came down low over the city. As they landed on Main Street, Lucas was relieved that they did not inadvertently trigger one of his magical wards, though he would have liked to see what it looked like for a man of Kyle's pride to giggle incessantly. Kyle dismounted and looked around. He seemed very impressed with the positions and readiness of the usually peaceful Cree people. Lucas was the first to approach Kyle, for he was very glad to see the battle-tested warrior. Unlike many of Lucas's friends, Kyle had been immediately friendly to him. He had told Lucas grand stories of his mage father. Lucas had learned more about his father from Kyle than from Garrett, who had actually known the man. Kyle, though nearly a stranger, seemed like one of Lucas's closest friends. Sir Lucas Archer, said Kyle with his arms spread wide. It's good to see you. He gave Lucas a rough hug and slapped him on the back. I wish it were under better circumstances. Believe me, responded Lucas. We're glad to see you too. I see you're as ready as you can be. My best men and I shall fight by your side. My airship will swing wide and flank them. Together, I think we just might defeat this foe. Take me to your highness, the heir. I should very much like to update him. Follow me said Lucas as he headed toward the Thunder Mansion. You should know he's not well. Oh? Lucas could not deny that Kyle was trying to cover up his pleasantly surprised reaction. As Kyle suppressed a grin, Lucas suddenly felt less respect for the man than he once did. What happened? asked Kyle, trying to sound concerned. Assassins. They tried to kill my wife. Garrett fought them off, but he was cut with a poisoned blade. Lemuscus, I think. And he's still alive? gasped Kyle. Gigi saved him. Kyle motioned for one of his men to come close and listen in. Gigi must be a more powerful mage than I thought, said Kyle. He's very skilled, answered Lucas. Hang on, did you say your wife? Lucas smiled. Vianette. Kyle clasped Lucas's shoulder. Congratulations! I had a feeling about you two. Thank you. I'm very glad nothing happened to her. It's a good thing Garrett was able to fend off the Red Raiders at all. He must be very skilled as well. We could use him in battle. Do you think he is capable of fighting? Sadly, no. Lucas failed to contemplate fine details, for he was constantly preoccupied with the looming battle. He tried to remember, however, what he had just said. Did he specifically tell Kyle that the assassins were Red Raiders? He must have, Lucas decided. Then I see it as my personal duty to stand watch over the royal grounds, said Kyle. No one will threaten the heir or your wife or the queen herself while I still draw breath. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate it. Six days after Kyle's arrival, the front of Kuroth's legion began to appear in the distance. Their long journey through the dark woods was over. They now marched on open Cree soil. Their wickedness descended upon Devonstone. Chapter 48 The Battle of Devonstone Devonstone had seen flaming arrows before. Therefore, when the hundreds of yellow points of light rose in the western sky, it came as no surprise. The perimeter buildings were emptied, so when fire rained upon them, no one was burned. Meanwhile, half of Devonstone's people, clad in Black Eagle uniforms, secretly moved behind the southern hills. To the north, Kyle's airship drifted quietly, unseen above the clouds. Thus far, everything was going as planned. Kuroth sent forth his fodder. Four lumbering giants stomped toward the city. The ground quaked before them. 
Lucas stood in a forward alleyway and watched their approach with grave concern. He wondered if his traps would even affect them. The other Lucas stayed close to the Thunder Mansion, deep within Devonstone. Vianette and the Queen were taking shelter in the basement. Lucas was on the front lawn with Kyle and his best men. Even at Kyle's far distance, he could hear the deep thuds of the giant's footfalls. Lucas doubly heard it, from close and from afar. One of Lucas's freezing traps went off. It was enough to turn the giant's legs to solid ice. The startled creature tried to jump back, but his icy legs rooted him to the ground. Take him down! Someone yelled. The rooftop archers sprayed the giant's torso with arrows. It swatted as if engulfed by a swarm of stinging insects. It was helpless. They had it. The giant slumped dead, but remained upright on its frozen pillars. Another of Lucas's traps went off. This time, it was a fire trap. A wide column of fire shot out of the ground and enveloped a giant. The frightened giant turned and ran, flaming through the Black Eagle's ranks, crushing troops as he did. Lucas could not have planned it any better. One giant slipped through the gap of expended traps. Arrows whistled and whined toward him, but he remained undeterred. He slowly stooped over the nearest house, which was in flames, and tore it from its foundation. The crumbling bricks slipped through his powerful fingers. Before the flaming house fully disintegrated in his crushing hands, the giant lifted the structure over his head and heaved it straight down Main Street. The wreckage tumbled and splayed out, killing untold scores of people. Though the giant was dumb, he knew the success of his attack. He hurled more houses. Too many archers were taking cover to deal enough damage. Except one, Lucas Archer, darted out into the street and ran straight toward the towering beast. Lucas was too insignificant for the huge monster to notice, so the giant went merrily about his business of house hurling. Lucas rolled to the side, leaped, and dove as he dodged the bricks raining down. He unsheathed the gleaming blade he was knighted with and ran for the giant's feet. A volley of arrows flew at Lucas from the Black Eagle's ranks. He took cover before one of the giant's column-like legs, and the arrows thudded into it instead. Lucas plunged his sword beneath the giant's big toenail and pried it up. The giant howled and grabbed at his injured foot. He hopped on one foot, which violently shook the ground. Lucas was almost crushed several times, and he immediately regretted his hasty attack. The giant was hardly stoic, however, and it hobbled and cried back toward the Wickermore River. Lucas was alone in the street when a wave of Black Eagle soldiers crowded in. He ran hard and fast between the nearest buildings as arrows whipped by all around him. Lucas heard his traps going off. He heard slices, crashes, zaps, and explosions. He heard a man laughing uncontrollably until someone struck him silent. Unfortunately, the traps, brutal as they were, did not cause enough damage to deter the invaders' dense advance. Lucas stayed in the narrow gangway and waited for the troops to pass. When they did pass, he sent several of them into fiery doom with collovium. The last giant saw what happened to his kin. He was smart enough to run headlong into Devonstone rather than walk and remain an open target. He ran past Lucas. It was as Justin said. Each step was like an earthquake that threw everyone off balance. After a dozen strides, the beast was in the middle of town, imposing havoc. That was the first sign that Devonstone's people were losing control of the fight. Far back, at the rear of the 5th Legion's ranks, the Barak Kuroth stood ominously, surrounded by a pack of his dark wolf minions. He calmly watched the battle unfold. Gigi's ambush worked perfectly. An entire platoon charged the mannequin-filled cul-de-sac, where Gigi shot a holding spell from his staff and paralyzed a dozen soldiers. They were quickly taken down with arrows. 
The platoon's remainder hacked stupidly at their phony foes for a moment before they realized that they were slaughtering wooden dummies. A moment was much too long to be in a shooting gallery. They were snuffed out. A cannon's deep boom echoed. The White Eagle airship descended through the northern clouds and harassed the bulk of Kuroth's legion with cannon fire. As the projectiles struck the sea of humanity, men went flying in all directions. Still, Kuroth seemed unconcerned. Devonstone's Black Eagle imposters waited patiently for the airship to deplete its ammo so they would not be hit. Justin was prone atop the southern hill and watched as the legion slowly moved into the city. When they were completely in and the cannon fire stopped, Justin would signal for the imposters to bring up the rear, filter in, and attack. The waiting was almost unbearable. The last giant was close to the Thunder Mansion, too close. Kyle and his men went into action. Astride their flying horses, the men flew circles around the beast and shot it with arrows. The giant managed to swat a pegasus out of the sky. He crashed hard on the lawn. Lucas helped its rider to his feet. He was uneasy, but okay. The pegasus he rode was dead. Kyle, riled, swooped in toward the giant's face, barely dodging two swats. The resulting wind nearly blew him off the saddle. His pegasus landed on the giant's shoulder. Kyle quickly impaled the giant's eye with a roundhouse stab of his blade. The giant fell out from under him and crashed deafeningly upon the lawn. What's going on up there? cried Vianette as dust fell on her from the basement's cobweb-laced ceiling. The giant's fall still reverberated off the walls. The queen clutched Vianette's hand tightly. Garrett fell off the couch. The great rumble of the giant's fall was enough to get him up. He had to investigate the massive tremor. He stumbled toward the front door and quickly became dizzy. He flung the door open and saw the giant splayed out on his belly. It's okay, Garrett, said Lucas. We got him. A tar-coated flaming boulder whooshed by thirty feet over Lucas's head and imploded a roof three houses away. Lucas fell prone, but Kyle and his men remained standing, unafraid. The catapults were firing. It was like being in the midst of a meteor shower. At any moment, anyone's life could end, and everyone knew it. The airship depleted its volleys, effectively thinning the Fifth Legion's ranks. It lowered into the danger zone and dozens of ropes dropped from the gondola. The remaining White Eagle soldiers rappelled down. The airship, low and out in the open, was finally vulnerable. After being harassed by it many times in the past, the Black Eagle finally had a clear shot at it. The catapults were turned slowly on their rickety wheels, reloaded, and fired. They sprang loudly, hurling fiery missiles upon the doomed airship. The boulders easily punched through the vessel and slammed into the ground behind it. The airship ignited and barreled into the ground, crushing several of the White Eagle men and sent up a column of thick black smoke. The entire hillside was alive with flames and tumbling wreckage. As the cheering Black Eagle Legion was distracted by the airship and the burning White Eagle soldiers, Justin's imposters, clad in Black Eagle uniforms, slipped in amongst their ranks. The signal was given, and utter chaos ensued. Black Eagle fought against Black Eagle, but those with the green bands never fought each other, for they were truly Devonstonians. At that late hour, neither side had an obvious advantage. Attacks were countered. Defenses fell. The battle shifted back and forth. Kuroth had enough. His men were disappointing him, so he took matter into his own claws. He swept through with a broad shield and a ten-foot sword specially designed for Barrocks. He madly swung his massive blade in a wide arc killing anyone in his path without consideration of their allegiance. His dark wolf underlings pattered ahead, snapping at any close living thing. Everyone, Black Eagle and Devonstonian alike, quickly learned to give Kuroth and his minions a wide berth. Meanwhile, 
Lucas saw an efficient-looking group of troops hustling through an alley. He did not recognize their dark leather armor as belonging to Black Eagle, White Eagle, or Devonstonian. They were an unknown party. Lucas was not sure of their intentions, but they were heading toward the Thunder Mansion. That was all he needed to know. He ran after them. The Lucas at the mansion, cognizant of what his other self saw, warned Kyle, and they prepared to receive the unknown warriors, whatever their intentions. The thunder-like noise of homes being destroyed by catapult projectiles was soon joined with the noise of real thunder. The atmosphere grew dark and menacing. As night fell, jagged veins of bright lightning spread out across the turbulent sky. Rain suddenly gushed down in torrents, and Devonstone was choked with steam and smoke as the fires sputtered beneath the deluge. There was no more semblance of order in the darkness. Chaos ran amuck in the streets. The steady clashing of swords rang out everywhere. Arrows flew in every direction. Dark wolves scampered through, unchecked, killing and gorging. Kuroth's advance was unstoppable as he cut a bloody trail through the men. His toothy grin was wide. There was no safe place. Blake was stout in the defense of his home. He had quickly become comfortable with his trusty battle axe, which was too heavy for the average fighter. Blake wielded it with relative ease, however, when he swung far and wide at any Black Eagle soldier who dared come close enough. The piles of dead soldiers around him were a testament to his ferocity. Fuga was there, too, beside the house, and defending it almost as well as his burly son. He could hardly believe the sight of his innocent son's wrath. Tall Kuroth saw over the crowds of fighting soldiers. He witnessed Blake's onslaught. Kuroth was personally unthreatened by Blake, but he did not like the young man's bold stand, for such successful audacity could potentially inspire the Devonstonians further. Kuroth's long, hairy arm raised high, sword in hand, which signaled the catapult crew. Kuroth pointed his blade at Blake's house. The catapult crew went into action and put the leather hide home in their sights. Blake felt very mighty before the flaming boulder came. He saw it crest and glow ominously in the black, rainy sky. He did not know what to do. Suddenly, mighty Blake felt helpless. The boulder crashed into the leather-hide home and sheared away half of it, leaving the other half to crumble. Blake, deaf from the noise, dropped to his knees. Horror! stole his will to move, even as flaming bits of debris rained upon him. There were dead bodies amidst his ruined house. Darlene was dead. Gretchen was dead. Fuga was dead. His whole family was gone in a mere second. There were countless fatalities, yet defiantly, amidst the death, a life was beginning. Just after midnight, high above the storm clouds, in the starry October sky, the Arrow Comet was crossing the bow of the Archer constellation. Lucas! the queen yelled from the mansion's window. Fionette is going into labor! Chapter 49 The Tyrant King's Return Lucas sprinted through the alley, through the rain, The unknown warriors were fast, and they had a good head start. He could not bear the thought of those men assaulting the mansion, especially now that Vianette was going into labor. Lucas hoped they were friendly, hoped they were allies. Unlike the Black Eagle, they passed by several opportunities to strike down Devonstonians, which was encouraging. Still, their movements seemed very suspicious. They moved swiftly, purposefully, Lucas feared that such conviction somehow did not seem friendly. The other Lucas rushed down to the Thunder Mansion basement. Garrett had already stumbled down the stairs and was beside Vianette's cot as she began to bear down. 
Melinda was also there. She was ready to receive her grandchild and tend to the infant at the moment of birth. Lucas ran to Vianette's side, and she took his hand and crushed it. She strained and breathed heavily. Her face looked pale and clammy. Lucas wished he could somehow take her pain away. He looked at her straining face, but he did not just see her. He also saw those unknown warriors running through the alley as he gave chase. Kyle and his elite band of troops moved to intercept the unknown warriors. Lucas's suspicions were correct. The unknown warriors were not friendly. Both groups clashed violently. Lucas was not far behind. He watched the fight unfold while visions of the birth also flickered through his mind. He had to stop the battle from reaching Vianette. He had to stop it at all costs. At least he was by her side as well, to guard her with his life. Kyle and his band put up a heroic fight. They used enchanted weapons, powerful, rare artifacts that teemed with the elements. Unfortunately, their mysterious assailants had deadly powers of their own. Some were mages, and they unleashed brilliant magical attacks that lit their dreary surroundings with unnatural colors. Deadly lightning bolts from the clouds were invisibly steered toward Kyle's men. The bolts stabbed down violently with deafening thunderclaps. A few White Eagle soldiers fell as arcs of blue electricity danced about. Kyle began a calculated retreat. This new foe was daunting. Lucas ran through the rain. His footfalls splashed loudly. The unknown warriors, however, were too preoccupied with Kyle to take notice. Lucas fired a beam of frost from Colovium that froze two attacking mages. Kyle's quick-thinking men shattered them with crossbow bolts. The unknown warriors were dealt a stinging blow. Lucas had taken their mages in a single attack from behind, a frightening attack that left the mages as chunks of ice on the ground. As Lucas descended upon the remainder of the unknown warriors, they charged headlong into Kyle's men. The White Eagle soldiers expected the fight of their lives, but surprisingly, the unknown warriors plowed through their position and beyond. The warriors ran toward the Thunder Mansion. Lucas, Kyle, and his elite band gave a desperate chase. They're trying to get to the child, yelled Kyle. Stop them at all costs. The unknown warriors burst into the mansion. For a moment, they were lost in the house's great space. Vianette's muffled screams of labor steered them toward the basement door. Before they could reach it proper, Lucas and Kyle's men were upon them again. Lucas's mind was too muddled and too desperate to accomplish the subtle inflections of thought that spells required. He resorted to swordplay. Garrett was right. The blunt wood made his sword feel weightless in comparison. He effectively slashed through the unknown warriors. Kyle's men were more than impressed. They were inspired. They too slashed harshly upon the warriors, and soon there were only two left. It seemed like victory was at hand. Unfortunately, the fight still moved piecemeal toward the basement door, the one place Lucas did not want them to go. The other Lucas left Vianette's side to block off access to the basement. That was bad timing, for the two unknown warriors unexpectedly crashed through the basement door and tumbled down. Lucas was halfway up the flight of stairs when the warriors toppled over him and knocked him back down to the basement floor. Lucas's head slammed against the cool stone ground. He saw vivid dots of light before the world went black. While he was unconscious, his other self was left with the single eyesight of a normal, unduplicated person. It was strange to suddenly lose the double vision of two perspectives he had become accustomed to over the years. Lucas, Kyle, and the White Eagle men noisily clambered down the stairs. The unknown warriors did not wait for their pursuers to descend. The two of them got off the unconscious Lucas and ran for Vianette. Garrett tackled one of the warriors. His weakness had just barely allowed him to do it. The remaining unknown warrior moved in toward Vianette, but Melinda blocked his path. 
he yanked a distinct black dagger from his belt and stabbed her. An assassin's weapon designed to reflect no light now shined with royal blood. The queen of the woodland realm fell to the blade of an anonymous attacker. The baby's cry pierced through all the grunts and strains of fighting. Vianette was screaming in fear and anger. Garrett, severely weakened, desperately grappled with the other warrior. The conscious Lucas, armed with sword and wand, rushed to their aid. His double perspectives were coming back. His other self was waking up. He just might be able to stop them yet. Kyle pulled out a wand of his own. He spun on the armed Lucas and hit him with a paralyzing spell. Lucas froze in place, utterly helpless. Kyle's men attacked everyone, including Garrett. Lucas watched with horror, unable to move, and was completely blindsided by Kyle's baffling traitorous actions. The White Eagle men were struggling with the unknown warriors while Kyle approached Vianette unchecked. Lucas tried to will his other self to recover. Get up! He cried to himself with unspoken words. Sorry, Highness, Kyle said to Vianette. This has to be done. Kyle scooped up the crying baby and sliced through the umbilical cord with a dagger. Lucas could see his child for the first time. Amniotic fluid still clung to his little body and head. The cruel spell kept him from reaching out. With all Vianette's remaining strength, she tried to get up and stop him, but intense pain caused her to double over instead. Kyle looked down on her with pity, like he wanted to help her, but he had more pressing business. Kyle gently tucked the wailing infant into the crook of his arm. I'm sorry, he said to both Lucas and Vianette. I must do this. This boy is the tyrant king. He must be taken to Veroxia, where he can be contained. Fear not. I will not harm him in any way. Keeping him here would be the harm, the doom of us all. We will keep him well, teach him well, and watch him well. Goodbye, my friend. No, stop! cried Lucas as he started to regain full consciousness and struggled to get up. Vianette was moaning and straining. She was still in much pain. Garrett's face was red with fury, but he was too weak to move. His muscles were like dead lumps of weight. The two remaining unknown warriors were held fast by White Eagle men while Kyle hustled up the stairs with the baby jiggling in his arms. After he safely escaped, Kyle's men floored everyone and then trampled up the stairs behind their leader. The paralyzed Lucas stood like a statue, but the other Lucas, broken and bewildered, shakily stood on his feet again. Lucas gave chase up the stairs. Garrett tried to follow, but he fell. His overwhelmed body was far beyond its limits of taxation. Lucas followed the sound of their noisy escape to the front lawn. Kyle and his traitorous band leaped onto their winged steeds and took Lucas's baby into the stormy sky. Lucas could only scream until his voice wavered, but he could not follow. The paralyzed Lucas's perspective flickered through his mind. There was more commotion downstairs. Vianette was still vulnerable to the two unknown warriors. They were doing something to her. Lucas ran for the stairs and stumbled quickly down. He was not sure what he could do, but he had to try something. Lucas never imagined that it was happening all over again. Vianette was struggling, and another baby was coming out of her, a twin boy. The infant came into the hands of the unknown warrior who had killed his loving grandmother. Lucas shocked and horrified, darted toward the killer who held his baby. Lucas was intercepted and smashed across the side of his head by the unknown warrior's one remaining companion. Lucas dropped to the floor and could barely move. Powerless, the paralyzed Lucas watched as the kidnapper prepared to leave with his second son. 
The man cut through the umbilical cord with the same knife he used to kill the queen. He then pulled to the flowery quilt off of Vianette and wrapped the baby up in it. Without a word, the callous killer and his remaining companion ran upstairs and into the stormy night with Lucas's other boy. Lucas dizzily struggled to his feet, frantically crawled up the stairs, and stumbled after them. They were far gone, though, by the time Lucas made it outside. Both of his precious newborn sons were quickly being taken away in different directions. There was no way to give chase. Chapter 50 The End of an Age 5. Dark Wolves Surrounded Gigi The young mage was wise in using the rain to his advantage. He solidified the rain into sharp icicle hail that stabbed down on the dark wolves like daggers. The ice impaled them, and they yelped, but it was not enough. Gigi crystallized the surrounding rain into a towering ice ogre. The crackling, crunching monster slammed the wolves high and far to protect its conjurer. The wolves darted back, however, and leaped upon Gigi's icy ally. Kuroth's minions tore viciously with heated breath, and the ogre was quickly reduced to slush. Gigi levitated a foot high and then slammed his staff into the ground, causing the rain-soaked street to become solid ice. The wolves' paws were anchored in the smoky, steaming ice, effectively immobilizing them. They were creatures of the fire realm, however, and the heat inherent with their kind was quickly melting through. Gigi knew when he was outmatched. He ran. The ice barely bought him enough time to escape. He was huffing and trembling, but he was one of the few who were able to successfully evade the dark wolves' onslaught. Gigi, still shaky, saw Blake absentmindedly shuffling down the street, even though the battle raged all around him. Blake carelessly dragged his battle axe behind him, making a grating, grinding noise. With his guard down like that, he was susceptible to being killed at any moment. Gigi dashed for his big friend and put his arm around him. Come on, Blake! shouted Gigi. It's not safe here! He pushed Blake close to a building, away from the fighting. Blake did not respond to anything Gigi said. Gigi was not particularly skilled with mind-reading spells, but he gave it a try anyway. With his fingers spread wide over Blake's blank stare, Gigi saw an elusive vision of the Leatherhide's deaths. Gigi understood. He guided Blake away from the battle toward the Thunder Mansion. Justin had gone through five full quivers. His arms ached with every pull of his bowstring. He had lost count long ago of the lives ended by his hand. He stayed on the rooftops, which always provided an excellent vantage point of the action. His heart was steady and his mind clear. Nothing scared him, for nothing saw him. The stormy night raged on. Justin carefully surveyed his surroundings. There were few of either side left. The people of Devonstone had put up an unexpected, remarkable fight for Garrett had taught them well. Alas, the Fifth Legion was the victor. Any Devonstonian who was skilled or lucky enough to survive thus far was soon taking cover in a house somewhere. Justem was powerless to contribute any more to the lost cause. He decided to retreat back to the Thunder Mansion. The storm calmed and it was daybreak when Justem arrived at the mansion. There were several dead soldiers strewn about. He heard a flurry of activity in the basement. He hurried down and saw Vianette huddled on a cot, crying. The queen's body was on the floor and covered with a sheet that had a small blood stain. Garrett, Lucas, and Gigi were in the midst of a heated discussion. Gigi had released Lucas from the paralyzing spell. Blake, with a vacant expression, was standing in a corner. Oh, just him! said Lucas. I'm glad to see you're okay. Lucas explained every awful detail of the abductions. He spoke quickly, shakily, and cried at times. 
It was difficult to understand him, but Justin managed. He did not understand it, however, when Lucas said, I just got back. Everyone turned when someone else came down the stairs. It was the other Lucas. He was carrying the painting of Meriwether's thicket under his arm. Oh, good, said Gigi. You're back already. One Lucas propped the painting against the wall while the other Lucas slid into it. Gigi carefully picked up Vianette and handed her to the Lucas in the painting. Lucas carried Vianette to their thicket house, up the stairs to their bedroom, and put her into a soft bed. I'll be back soon, he said. She nodded. Lucas rushed back through the thicket. It was strange to suddenly be in that peaceful world. He ran until he fell out of the painting and back into the brutal reality of the basement. Lucas grabbed the nearest knife, cut the painting out of its frame, and rolled it up. Smart, said Justin. That's a good way to get her out of here. Yeah, said Lucas. Now we need to decide where to go. The Lord of the Fire Realm, Renald, though far within the depths of Obsidia, saw the attack on Devonstone through some extrasensory perception. He believed it to be a colossal failure and was outraged. He telepathically communicated with Kuroth. How can you expect to prevent the Tyrant King's return with so few men left, Kuroth? asked Renald. Kuroth quickly dropped to a knee, even though no one was before him. I'll send forth my minions, great one, and they'll burn the city to the ground. I wanted confirmation of the tyrant's demise, not ashes to sift through. Renald's harsh voice made Kuroth's ears slick back. I didn't want to do it this way, Kuroth, but you've left me with no choice. I wish you wouldn't have forced me to use such clumsy methods. What do you intend to do? Kuroth dared to ask. Even he could not believe the bold question escaped his toothy mouth, but sheer curiosity had gotten the best of him. He was answered by a slight tremble beneath his paws. I'm sending a rock worm, said Renald. His voice crackled and hissed like fire. But Lord, something like that might draw the Varoxian's attention. You should have thought of that before you failed me. Now, even the mighty Kuroth feared for his survival. He dropped to all fours, leaving his weapons behind, and ran as fast as he could. Even a horse would have been hard-pressed to keep up with him. The ground shook violently, and several of Devonstone's buildings crumbled. The two Lucases, Justin, Gigi, Garrett, and Blake, exited the trembling mansion for fear of its collapse. Whatever was causing the quake, they knew it was too great a foe to contend with. They all ran east with their weapons at the ready. Some instinctive clue told them to keep running east. Perhaps it was away from where the tremors emanated. Perhaps it was away from that scary, omnipresent rumble. The ground to the west of Devonstone opened up. The hills fell away into a black, gaping hole. Something from the fire realm, something gargantuan, was ascending. The quake grew even more violent, and running away became a process of repeatedly falling and recovering. Lucas could only look over his shoulder for split seconds at a time, for the city around him was caving in. He saw the rockworm's emergence. It stretched up high into the clouds and rattled off a deep roar. It looked like a stony skyscraper, for it was a thousand feet tall and had not even fully emerged. Much to their horror, the monster tipped forward slowly until gravity took over, and it crashed down on Devonstone with unparalleled force. 
It sent out a shock wave that knocked them down. Blinding clouds of dust and debris overtook them. A succession of ground swells rolled out like giant water ripples, causing them to rise and fall. They could not see through the dense debris cloud, but they could hear the rockworm's maw chewing everything within reach. Its nightmarish mouth was vast and cave-like, filled with rows of teeth that were like stalactites and stalagmites. It did not have hundreds or even thousands of teeth. It had millions of teeth that spanned the inside of its tubular body's entire length. Lucas and his friends got up and ran for their lives. Garrett was still too weak from the poison, and he collapsed. They did not have a moment to spare. Lucas quickly unrolled his painting, pushed Garrett inside, and rolled it back up. Then they resumed their frantic dash toward Devonstone's perimeter. They ran for miles until the exhaustion was overwhelming. When they were safe and could not run any more, they walked as quickly as their burning legs would tolerate. More miles accumulated behind them. When the rock worm was just a distant rumble, they collapsed on a hillside and looked toward Devonstone. The rock worm let out an eerie moan, which gave them chills and vibrated the grass. The creature devoured the last of the city. It ate everything. The bricks, roads, wood, people, animals, and everything else Devonstone had to offer was scooped into the rock worm's maw and chewed. Its body would later determine the organic, digestible components of its meal and expel the rest. When the town was completely gone, the rock worm slipped loudly back into its hole, which closed in after it. The monster returned to the fire realm, where its fellow denizens were every bit as harsh. There was little evidence that Devonstone had ever even been there. Only a huge gouge through the landscape remained. Their homes were gone. West Woodland Middle School and Yellowleaf High School were gone. The market was gone. Anyone who could not escape was chewed up by the rockworm. All that remained was a crater of rock and upturned soil. They rested for a long while on the hillside, looking at the valley where Devonstone used to be, disbelieving what they were looking at, disbelieving that such carnage was possible. They all cried. A renewed sob erupted every time they remembered someone who must have ended up in the rockworm's bowels. Gigi began to comprehend Blake's grief, for although he did not see the demise of his parents, nor of his beloved Emily, he was sure they could not have survived. They were far closer to the city's center and almost certainly did not have enough time to escape before the rockworm ascended. He was not as close to his parents as Blake was to his, but the loss of Emily made him sob uncontrollably. Garrett crawled out of the painting of his own volition. Though more worldly, he too was awestruck by the devastation. He secretly blamed himself for being so wholly unprepared for such a move. Various motivations dictated that they could not sit there forever. Lucas wanted nothing more than to find his sons. Gigi, Justum, and Garrett, with nowhere else to go, wanted nothing more than to help him. Blake was a shell of his former self but the beginnings of vengeance began to stir within his traumatized gut. I know of a land route to Varoxia, Garrett suddenly blurted. His voice broke the silence and everyone jumped. Some say the route is a legend, but I don't believe so. The tallest mountain in the world, the Horn Spire, supposedly juts up into the sky realm, Its peak just barely pokes through to the cloudlands. I know how to get there. But what about my other son? asked Lucas. Who took him? Where are they going? I don't know who they are, Lucas, said Justin. But if they left on foot and made it out of Devonstone alive, 
then I could probably pick up their trail. Lucas had an epiphany. Two guides, two Lucases, Lucas whispered under his breath. Huh? said Justin. I have an idea, said Lucas. One of me will go with Garrett to Varoxia, find Kyle, and get my son back. The other of me will go with Justin and hunt for those bastards who took my other son, whoever they are. But Lucas, Gigi interjected, you still only have one mind. Could you possibly concentrate on two potentially vastly dissimilar quests at the same time? I have to try. I won't choose one of my sons over the other, especially not when I have the unique fortune of being physically doubled. What about the rest of us? That tiredly spoken question was the first thing Blake had said since witnessing the deaths of his family members. Everyone stared at him for a moment and then looked away with pity and sorrow. Well, will you help me? Lucas hoped the task would occupy Blake's grieving mind. Blake nodded and then looked at Garrett. Is there any black eagle in Varoxia? No, Blake, Garrett answered. Of course not. Then I ain't going to Varoxia, said Blake. I'm going with the Lucas that stays on the ground, and I'm going to kill any black eagle that crosses my path. That settles it then, said Lucas. Justin, Blake, and I shall hunt for the unknown men here in the woodland realm. Garrett, Gigi, and I shall go to Varoxia and search for Kyle. Agreed? What about my sister? asked Garrett. I want her to go wherever there will be the least danger, Lucas proclaimed. The mountains are treacherous, replied Garrett. She should stay in the woodland realm. Sounds reasonable, said Lucas. What about him? Justin asked as he pointed behind himself with his thumb. They suddenly realized that little Vernon Dubell was standing behind them the whole time. Vernon! shouted Lucas. You got out! He stood and slapped Vernon on the back. Of course I did. I was right behind you the whole time. Which one of you should I go with? Are you sure you want to go? asked Lucas. Where else am I going to go? Good point, said Blake. I want to go to Varoxia said Vernon. I always wondered about that place. Garrett whispered in Lucas's ear. We'll take him. We'll drop him off at some settlement before it gets too dangerous. His suggestion seemed appropriate. Okay, Vernon, said Lucas. You can come. None of them had eaten or slept in the last 39 hours. The hunger pains had to be dealt with, but sleep was still out of the question. Every time one of them closed their eyes for more than ten seconds, visions of carnage appeared upon the back of their eyelids. Everyone went into the painting to have a final meal together at Lucas and Vianette's home. One of the Lucases stayed in the outside world to keep watch. They went to the Mandalay Creek within the painting and rinsed off the gray grime coating that covered them from head to toe. Lucas could not help but think that the gray grime that washed off their bodies and down the stream was all that was left of Devonstone. They drank the cool water and hacked out the dirty mucus that plagued their lungs from breathing in the cloud of Devonstone's destruction. When everyone was grime-free, they gathered and ate in the bedroom so that they were by Vianette's side. They told her of what happened in the outside world. It took a while for the shock to wear off, but she eventually managed to recover. They told her of their intentions to search for her sons. She thought their plans were sound, but she wished they did not need to separate. Alas, it was necessary. The friends' final time together seemed short, too short, but there was a prevailing sense of urgency. They left the painting at midday. 
Vianette was in no condition for a journey, however, so she was forced to stay in the painting and in bed. Before the two groups went their separate ways, they hugged, shook hands, and bid each other a fond farewell. Lucas even managed to get everyone to chuckle slightly when he hugged and shook hands with his other self. Of course, they would always have Lucas's connection to keep them informed of their respective progress, but saying goodbye was difficult nonetheless. Lucas, Garrett, Gigi, and Vernon headed north. They would have to delve far beyond strange foreign lands. The voyage to the Horn Spire would be daunting enough, but attempting to climb it was suicide. Even still, there was a chance that the mountain would not take them high enough to reach wondrous Varaxia, the Sky Realm. Lucas, Justin, Blake, and a recovering Vianette in tow were more aimless. The great unknown was all around them. They had not the slightest inkling of where their journey would take them. Because they were not trying to get to Varaxia, their trek was considered the easier of the two quests, but the unknown can bear many surprises. Little did any of them know that the Lord of Chaos, Demagorok himself, had great plans in store for them.